Jonah. Well, last week we did start this series on Jonah. If you didn't have a chance to be with us, we're going to review real quick in just a minute. But we said that if you know anything about Jonah, you know that most people associate Jonah with the uh, whale. Very good. You picked up from last week. That's great. Um, you, you, Jonah and the whale just kind of go together. In fact, because of the whale, many people uh, ridicule the story of Jonah. In fact, the story of Jonah and the whale is probably, if it's not the top, it's next to the top of the stories that are ridiculed by most people. Most people hear the story of Jonah or they hear the word Jonah, they relate it to the whale and they go, you got to be kidding me. You know, you really believe that story that a guy got swallowed by a whale. Reminds me of a story I heard about a little girl. She was in school, a little girl sharing with her classmates about the story of Jonah and the whale. And she told them the whole story. Her teacher overheard it. And when she got all done, the teacher said, now, now children, we know that's just a fairy tale. It didn't really happen. We know that nobody can survive in a whale for three days. And the little girl looked at the teacher and she very strongly and boldly said, it is so true, it comes from God's word and God's word is true. And the teacher looked, hallelujah, that's right. And the teacher looked back down at the little girl and she said, sweetie, that it just wouldn't happen, it's just not possible and you just need to know that that's not reality. And the little girl, once again, she looked and just was adamant and she said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah if it's true. And the teacher kind of looked at her with kind of a, a you know, sarcastic grin. And she said, well, what if Jonah went to hell? And she said, well, I guess you'll have to ask him. <laughs> Probably not the best answer. But you know, sometimes we get frustrated because there are some stories in, the, in, in God's word that seem somewhat incredible. But if you remember what we talked about last week, your faith in the book of Jonah and the story of Jonah doesn't take place in that story or in that book. Your faith, my faith, and whether or not God can preserve a man three days and three nights in the belly of a giant fish is rooted way back in the first few pages of the book of Genesis. If you understand, if I believe that God is a God who is powerful and almighty and can speak the words and make it happen, then him preserving a person inside the belly of a giant fish for three days and three nights is not a problem. And so we talked about how important it is that we keep our perspective, and I cautioned you last week, don't let the whale block your view of the great details of this book. Because if you're not careful, like so many people, you get so fixated on the whale that you miss the, the details, the important details of what's going on in this book. In fact, I don't know if you've noticed it, maybe some of you that have been reading it, the whale is only mentioned th in three verses in the whole book. That's it. And we're going to look at two of the three this morning. We'll probably make reference to the third one. But that's all he's in there for. But, the, but the, the reality is the whale is so big in people's minds that they miss the whole point of the story. So last week we began in chapter 1. And as we moved through chapter 1, we saw that God comes to Jonah. He's a prophet. And if you remember, a prophet's job is to speak for God. God gives messages to the prophet. The prophet is to take God's word and deliver it to the people. Whether that's a king or an entire kingdom, uh, God had used the prophets to speak in that way. Jonah is a prophet. God goes to Jonah and God says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach that I'm going to judge them because their wickedness has come up before me. Well, Jonah doesn't answer there's no answer. We don't read about Jonah saying anything to God. All we read in verse 2 is that he gets up and he goes in the opposite direction. And what we looked at last week is Jonah actually has to kind of work at this whole deal. He goes 50, uh, 50 miles from where he's living to a port town of Joppa. He has to look for a boat that's going in the direction he wants to go. He finds that boat. It says he pays money to be a passenger on that boat. He gets on the boat and he starts sailing to Tarshish, 
which is over 2,000 miles from Nineveh where he's supposed to go. And so you get the idea right away in the first few verses of this story, Jonah wants nothing to do with Nineveh. He wants nothing to do with following God's plan. Jonah wants to be as far away from that whole deal as he can get. And so as the story goes, it says that the Lord brings up this wind, a great storm comes, and, the, and it must be bad because these guys are seasoned sailors and they're freaking out. They start throwing stuff off the ship. They start praying to their gods to, for help. Nothing's working. The captain of the boat starts walking around to try to figure out what's happening. He goes down into the bottom of the boat looking for anybody and everybody, and here's Jonah asleep at the bottom of the boat. He wakes him up and how on earth can you be asleep at a time like this? Pray to your God. Maybe he'll have mercy on us. Maybe he'll help us. Well, nothing happens. The storm gets worse. They figure somebody, somebody here has done something wrong. This storm, is, this storm has got to be some kind of judgment from a God. And so they cast lots. They, they do some kind of procedure in which to try to determine who the culprit is. And the lot lands on Jonah. And they start asking him questions. Man, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? What on earth is going on? And Jonah told him, I, I serve Yahweh. I'm Hebrew. I'm a prophet. He told me to do something and I ran away. And they're like, what on earth? Why? How could you do this? This is nuts. And he said, please tell us, what can we do to make this storm stop? And Jonah says, well, if you'll take me and throw me overboard, it'll be all okay. The storm will stop. You guys will be fine. Well, they didn't want to do that. Which is kind of crazy if you think about it. These, these godless sailors have more concern and mercy for a guy they don't even know than Jonah has for a whole nation that God told him to go preach to. Well, they say, man, we can't do that. We can't throw you overboard. That's crazy. And so they keep trying to do everything that they can, but the storm is getting worse. And finally they realize, we got to at least try it and we're all dead. And so they go before God and they say, God, please don't. Don't hold this against us. Don't hold this against us. And they grab Jonah and they throw him over the side. And where we saw the story end last week is immediately the storm calms. The sailors realize this God is for real. And it says they make vows to him. And that's just a fancy way of saying, God, you're the real deal. We're going to follow you. So a little revival, despite Jonah's rebellion, a revival breaks out on that ship deck. Because God's bigger than your rebellion or my rebellion. God can cut through and work through all that stuff. In the meantime, we ended on this last verse, verse 17 of chapter 1. Now the Lord had arranged for the great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Now let me say something before we step into chapter 2. Did you notice? It doesn't say whale. We don't know if it was a whale. Scripture tells us it was a big fish. Kind of a little side note, but just something to think about. So Jonah is now in the whale. What do you do when you're in a whale? Let's find out. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. Yeah, you do. You do a lot of praying when you're inside a big fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence. Yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped around itself around my head. 
I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth whose gates lock shut forever. But you, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. And my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercy. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. And I will fulfill all my vows. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. And the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out on to the beach. I just got to tell you, there is so much packed in those 10 verses. There is so much going on there. Jonah is the only guy I know on record that we have the information of what took place when he was inside the belly of a giant fish. And what's he do? He prays. He calls out to God. And there's some very important lessons that you and I can learn from Jonah's prayer. Good chance none of us are going to end up inside the belly of a whale. Literally. But we may figuratively. We may spiritually. And there are some great lessons that we can learn from this. So if you'll follow along in your notes, let me give you the first one. God answers when you call out to him. That's one of the things I learned here. God answers when you call out to him. Verse 1 says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. He's inside this fish. We get this record of his prayer. Listen, let me say this. This is not Jonah's prayer as he dictated or wrote it down inside the fish. You know, I've seen some pretty crazy pictures uh, that people have drawn uh, likenesses of supposedly of Jonah and the whale. You know, he's sitting there. Who knows where the table and chair come from? But he's sitting at a table and chair with a candle on the table inside the belly of the, you know, and there's this full outline of a fish. Folks, that ain't how it was. There's, there's nothing romantic about this deal at all. Think about something inside your digestive tract, huh? It's smelling pretty bad in there. It's cramped, it's warm, it's, it's not pleasant. This is where Jonah's at. Jonah writes about this prayer after the experience. This is what we're reading in chapter 2. This isn't all of Jonah's prayer. It's a summation of what he prayed while he was in that fish that he writes about later as he recalls the whole incident that went on. And if you notice, too, maybe you see how it's kind of broken up in your, in your Bible. It's written in kind of poetic form. It's almost, some people call it a psalm of Jonah. It's, it's written in a poetic form. Jonah is writing down in a summation, a poetic summation of what his prayer was all about. And that's what we're getting here. But the basic idea is that he's in this mess and he calls out to God. Look at verse 2. He says, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble and he answered me. Now, if you don't have that underlined in your Bible, I would underline, I would circle it. I would do something. He answered me. He answered him. You mean God answered Jonah who had just basically said to God just a little while before, God don't want anything to do with you or your order. I'm out of here. And he goes in the opposite. God answers a guy like that? God answers a guy who's rebellious? God answers a guy who's disobedient? God answers a guy who's running from him? Are you catching what I'm saying here? If God will answer him, I think he'll answer you and me. This is very hopeful because God answers Jonah. He goes on. He says it again. I called to you from the land of the dead. I was as good as dead. And the Lord, you heard me. Folks, stop and think about that for a minute. We take this for granted. We, oh, 
And look, I'm right there. I'm right there. Somehow in our thinking, we think that God should listen to us. That somehow we deserve for God to hear us. We're talking about the God of the universe who spoke it all into existence. I mean, think about the vastness of the universe. Just, just amazing how huge the universe is. If you can't comprehend like that, that, something like that, like I have a hard time comprehending, think about the sun, how huge and massive the sun is. You can put so many hundreds of earths in the sun and they said you can shake it like a rattle. That's how big the sun. Think about that. And God is bigger than that. Almighty, all-powerful, immutable, never changes. God will answer you when you call. That is amazing that a God that big would even care when we call, let alone answer when we call. Jonah is a guy who ran, rebelled, turned his back on, disobeyed. He's now in the belly of a fish, down who knows how deep, and he's calling out to God, and God is zeroed in on his voice. And I find that so amazingly hopeful. Because if God will listen to Jonah, then God will listen to you. God answers when we call. You say, why? Why on earth would God answer? Well, it goes back to what we looked at last week. Remember what we talked about last week? God will speak to you. Remember, that was our first point last week. God will speak to you. Why? Because he's a speaking God. All through scripture, we see him communicating with people. In fact, we said, this is his communication. We call it God's word. God is a communicating God. He speaks. Of course, that goes hand in hand with this idea that he wants to answer when we call. Jonah calls out to God after he's turned his back on him. He's run from him. And God, in his mercy and his grace and his love answers Jonah. And there's a couple of things that we can even learn from that. And here's the first one. The answer he gives may not look like you think it should. The answer that God gives may not look like you think it should. Now, if you read this prayer close, Jonah is recalling the time after he was thrown off of the boat and he's falling through the water. And he's praying and it says in verse 7 that God snatched him out of the mouth of death. This picture that the fish comes as the answer, part of the answer to Jonah's prayer and swallows him. I cannot imagine that as Jonah is falling through the water praying to God, he's thinking in his mind, if only God would bring a giant fish to swallow me, everything would be fine. I cannot imagine that's what he's thinking. Jonah is not thinking about a fish. He just knows he needs God and he needs God's answer quick. And God brings this giant fish, something that he wasn't looking for. He didn't think it was going to look like that, but that's the way that God did. God could have done it any way he wanted to, but he chose to use this giant fish. Listen, God will answer you, but be prepared. When he answers, it may not look like the, the way you think it should. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you're praying for something and, and you think it should look a certain way and be a certain thing or a certain uh, function in a certain way and God comes through and he answers the need but not with the same type of thing that you think that you need to get that job done or that situation taken care of. You're praying for food. God, we're hungry. We need something. And you're thinking of a T-bone. And God brings you a can of beans. And God took care of you. But it didn't look exactly the way you thought it should. Man, I was kind of thinking it was going to be, you know. And then God brings this. 
it's like, wow. Louise told the story in camp this summer uh, in the mornings to the kids of Corey Ten Boom. And if you've never read this book, it's fantastic. Um, give me the name again. Hiding Place. And uh, Corey Ten Boom was a, uh, from Holland. She lived uh, in Amsterdam, and her family helped hide Jews during World War II. Well, eventually they were found out and they were arrested and her and her sister uh, were sent to a concentration camp and they were put in this, this, this barrack, this filthy, dirty barrack with, with um, many, many other women that were um, sick and hurting and miserable conditions and the guards would harass them and, and, and hurt them and they prayed, the, the Christians in that little group would huddle together and they would pray and, 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 and they would pray about the, the bad conditions and the guards that were hurting them and God just keep them from us. Well, one day what happened is they got terrible fleas in their, in their um, barrack just terrible. They were all itching and it's, it's just awful. And, and the one, uh, Corey's sister says to her one day that we need to thank God for the fleas. And Corey was like, I refuse to do that. I'm not going to thank God for the fleas. That's ridiculous. That's, you've gone too far now thanking God for fleas. But something amazing happened. They noticed that the guards that used to come in and harass them and give them a hard time, they stopped coming in. And they didn't know why, but they, they were thankful. And they were like, wow, God answered our prayers. And they found out sometime later through the grapevine that the guards didn't want to come into their barrack because it was full of fleas and they didn't want to get bit by the fleas. See, God answered their prayer, but not in the way that they thought he should. God will, call, God will answer you when you call, but be prepared. He may answer you in a way that you may think is not the way that you thought it should be. Here's another idea. Don't wait until you're in great trouble to call out to God. I don't know if you noticed that, but in verse 2, Jonah says, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble. Your passage might say distress. Um, it's the same idea. This is, this is great, a great problem. This is really bad. And notice how it starts. It says, then, the beginning of this chapter says, then Jonah prayed. Well, when is then? Then is when Jonah is already in a big mess. God comes to Jonah. He says, Jonah, I want you to go preach to Nineveh. We don't read about a response. We don't read Jonah saying, no, God, I really don't want to do that. God, please, I... Is there some place else? I'll go somewhere. We don't read that. We don't read, uh, we don't read Jonah questioning, saying, God, are, are you sure? Nineveh, are you sure? God? See, I do that kind of stuff. We don't even read Jonah saying, no, God, no way. No way. I'm not doing that. Nothing. There's no prayer, uh, that apparently, that goes on after God calls him. Jonah goes down and he's looking for a boat. Well, of course, Jonah's not praying, God, help me to find a boat going in the direction opposite of you. Of course, that's not happening. But then he gets in the boat and the storm comes up and things are bad. And the captain wakes him up and says, man, we're going to die. Get up and start praying to your God. He doesn't pray. If you notice in the story, the captain tells him to pray. He doesn't pray. He doesn't even pray for that. God, look, I know you brought this because of me. Don't, don't hurt these guys. God, nothing. There's nothing there. He's not praying to him. See, Jonah's not praying when things are, are, are okay. I mean, when God comes to him, it doesn't seem like there's any problems going on in Jonah's life. God says, hey, I want you to go to Nineveh. And then he runs away. And then the trouble starts. Well, then the lot falls on him and and you would think that that would get you praying, but he's not praying then. And then, then they come to him and they say, look, tell us what to do to get this storm to stop. And Jonah says, well, just throw me overboard instead of going, you know what? Here's what needs to take place. I need to get down on my face before God and repent, turn this boat around and go back to Joppa. I'm going to Nineveh. No prayer. No prayer. When's he start praying? He says, I cried out to the God in my great trouble. Jonah should have started praying. 
before you got into great trouble. But can I remind you of something? The book of Jonah is a mirror. And as you and I read it honestly, the reflection begins to look a whole lot like you and me. Because stop and think about it. When do we pray most? Oh, in great trouble, man, we're praying. Right? But can I encourage you? God wants to answer when you call out to him, not just in great trouble. You praying for your kids now? Before the trouble starts? Oh, oh, we, we kind of cruise along as we're raising our kids, and if everything's fine, everything's good, great, man, that's good. Every once in a while, somebody might say something, oh, yeah, praise the Lord, thank God. And then all of a sudden, one of them starts going astray, or they fall into trouble, and, oh, man, that's not good. And, and we try to, oh, we're going to give them lickings, get them back in line, and we try to get them back in line, and they keep going further and further. And now they've gone from trouble to great trouble, and now we're hitting our knees. Now we're going, oh, Lord, bring them back. Oh, God, do something in their life. Oh, God, bring them, bring them, come on. God bring them back but not until they got into great trouble did we start praying in a great way God says man call on me now our marriage is just kind of cruising we're just kind of doing our deal and everything's going good and we don't think about praying for our spouse like, pray. we're, we're doing fine I don't even pray for my spouse I have to pray for my spouse where everything's going fine and then all of a sudden things are a little rocky you know you just have a few more arguments than you did before but you know it's still no big deal you don't say anything to anybody because you know that's shame we don't say that and so we just kind of move along everything's going along pretty good and then we go from a few little rocky moments to it's getting really bad now now it's like oh slamming doors smack and pots saying things and then all of a sudden we find ourselves in our relationship in great trouble oh and then we're on our face oh dear God help me and then we're running to our girlfriends ladies and we're saying oh please pray for my man he is just a mess and he's all this and guys we just make hard and off oh, she just needs to get off she's off great troubles come and now we're praying. Now we're going to God. But God wants us to call on him before the great trouble comes. Oh, everything's going along pretty good. We're paying our bills. Everything's kind of, we're working it out, man. Life's okay, you know. I wish I had a little bit more money, but I'm able to take care of stuff. And then all of a sudden we hit a little financial bump in the road and it's a little bit more difficult. And we're still kind of like, well, you know, oh, I can handle, I can handle. We'll just pick up another job or I'll do this side deal and we're taking care of things. And, and then all of a sudden, man, we really hit it. And now we're, man, debt is just coming up to my throat and I don't know how we're going to take care of this. And they're coming after me for this and I don't know. Oh God, oh God, oh God, you got to answer me. God, there's got to be some big bank in the sky just dropping out on me right now, God. We're calling out because we're in great trouble. But we should have been praying all along before we ever even got into trouble, let alone great trouble. You see where Jonah's at? He's calling out to God. But it took great trouble. Many of us wait until great trouble comes. And then all of a sudden we have a revival in our prayer life. Well, I'm a prayer now. Because the fire's hot. The belly's warm. Those intestinal juices sting. And it's cramped. And I'm praying. I believe that some God, times God has to put us in the mood to pray. Jonah needed to be put in the mood to pray. Storm didn't do it. Sailors couldn't do it. The lot didn't do it. He had to get thrown in the sea to put him in the mood to call out to God. Man, don't wait for God to put you in the mood Call out to him now. Amen? Would you put this down? God answers when he knows you're ready to listen. 
God answers when he knows you're ready to listen. God answers when we call to him. It's just another way of saying he's speaking to us, right? And he'll speak when he knows we're ready to listen. You know, there's nothing worse than to repeat yourself over and over again to somebody and you just finally go, you know what? You're not listening. I'm done speaking, right? You ever do that? You ever just get to a point where you just go, you know what? I, you're not hearing what I'm saying, so I'm not talking anymore. See, God, God knows when we're ready to listen. And we'll call out to him and he'll speak when we get to that point when we're ready. Remember last week we said that when God speaks, then we're, it's going to bring up an opportunity to do one of two things, remember? We either obey or disobey. And the way that we respond, whether obedience or disobedience, is linked to our view of God. If we don't think that God really knows best in this situation, if we don't think that God is all powerful in this situation, if we don't think he's all loving or good in the situation that we're in, then we're probably going to do it our way and not God's way. Remember that? And so if that's true, and I believe it is, and I believe that's what was going on here with Jonah, if that's true, then God will let some things take place in our life to teach us some things that we need to know about him before he answers us. Jonah needed to learn some things. We need to learn some things sometimes. And I think one of the main things that Jonah needed to learn, would you put this down? You're ready to listen when you remember who God is. In verse 7, Jonah says, as my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. Jonah hadn't forgotten about God like in, oh, who's God? I don't know who that is. But he had forgotten about God as far as his person, what he could do, what he was all about. Jonah needed to understand in a new and, and distinctive way that God is amazingly sovereign. See, Jonah knew kind of on a, on a table level that God was sovereign. Because remember when the, when, the, uh, when the sailors started to question him, man, who are you? What's going on? He says, I serve God who made heaven and earth. Remember that? Or made the land and the sea. So Jonah, he, hey, God made it. He made it. But Jonah needed to know that God was more than just the creator of land and sea. God was also the controller of what's on the land and in the sea. Jonah needed to understand, Jonah, you can never run away from God. That is just idiotically impossible to do. Jonah needed to understand that this God is sovereign. Listen, that's what the fish is about. A big chunk of the fish is about this. I want you to stop and think about it for a minute. Jonah's on this ship, the storm comes up. Sailors freak, they go to Jonah. What do we do? Throw me over. They pick him up, they throw him over. And just at the right time, there happens to be a fish big enough to swallow Jonah at just the right time. Are you kidding me? Stop and think about it. That fish had to be at just the right place at just the right time. And then, and I don't know if you've ever fished before, that fish had to be hungry and wanting to eat. If you've ever fished before, it's some, one of the most frustrating things. You're in nice crystal clear water and you're fishing and you can see the fish and they are big and beautiful. And you know, oh, I've got this bait. They're going to love this. It's going to be great. And you throw out there and they swim by and you watch them. They swim up to it, kind of look at it and they just keep swimming. You go, no! If they're not hungry, they're not going to bite. So God prepares this fish to be there just at the right time, to open his mouth at just the right time, big enough to get Jonah, not chew him, just swallow him. Get him into that stomach. 
put him in that situation where those digestive, just, uh, digestive juices are just subtle enough to burn him a little bit, but not to dissolve his body. And then spit him out on shore. See, God could have done it any way he wanted to do it. Jonah needed to learn, Jonah, I'm in charge of it all. Right down to the fish in the sea that can swallow your butt up. Right down to the digestive process in that fish to keep it from dissolving your stanky body. I'm in charge of it all. It's a lesson Jonah needed to learn. And until Jonah learned that lesson, he wasn't ready to hear God when God called. So you go, why is that so important? I want you to think about this. It's going to be so important for Jonah to know that God is in control of a giant fish. Because he's eventually going to go to a giant empire, the Assyrian Empire. Stand in front of these people that have no problem hacking people's heads off, putting them in piles, taking their skin off their body, tacking it to the city wall, taking people's tongues and staking them into the ground. He's going to stand in front of those people and say, God is judging you for your sin. He's going to need to know that the same God who controlled the big fish can control the big empire. You see how important this lesson is? See, God will answer you when you're ready to listen, but there may be some lessons in the process before he gives you the answer. Jonah needed to know that God was going to be with him every step of the way, that this God was in control, that he was sovereign. Number two, you're ready to listen when you remember who you are. Jonah needed to remember who God was. He needed to remember who he was. Listen, in running from God, Jonah thought he was more than he really was. I mean, we read this and we're kind of like, what an idiot. He really thinks he could run from God? Well, stop and think about it for a minute. How many times have we done that? We run from God. God tells us to do something. He tells us to give something. He tells us to speak to somebody. I ain't doing that. We're, that's Jonah. That's the Jonah in us. And so when we look at Jonah and go, what an idiot. We should be looking at ourselves and going, what an idiot. How, how, how I, I really think I can get away from God? Now, I want you to know something. This is very important. Verse 7, I don't know about you. It seems like it comes out of nowhere. He's talking about God um, saving him from the depths and from the jaws of death. And then in verse 7, he, he seems to switch gears. He says, those who worship false gods turn their back on all God's mercies. And you go, oh, well, that, that's good. That's a good truth. But why, how does that fit right here? Do you understand what Jonah's saying here? Jonah's saying, God, you, you, you're in control of the, of the ocean, the waves. You threw me in the water. You're in control of this fish. God, you are all of that. And it's almost like he comes to this realization, man, anybody who worships a false god, they're turning their back. It says in my translation, it says mercies. In the Hebrew, it's the word hesed. It means God's unfailing love, his loyal love. Anyone who turns to a false god turns their back on the love of God. I'll go a step further, and I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm reading into Scripture here. Anyone who goes after a false god turns their back on love. Because that's what God is, right? God is love. They turn their back on true love. You say, well, why would Jonah say that here? Because Jonah realized that's exactly what he'd done. You say, wait a minute. I don't, where does it say that Jonah was worshiping a false god? Jonah's god, get this, get this. Jonah's god was Jonah. Jonah's god was Jonah. Because he had Two choices. Remember, God comes to him and he says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach that I'm going to judge it. He's got two choices. Obedience, disobedience. Please God, please self. He chooses what? Please self. 
Jonah says, God, I'm a better God than you are. Every time you and I choose against God's will, we're saying, God, I can God me better in this situation than you can. God, I'm a better God than you are right now. Jonah comes to the realization, I say that I worship Yahweh, but I've been worshiping a false god. When I ran the opposite direction, I was turning my back on love itself. That's what he's saying here. See, Jonah calls out to God. God's ready to answer him when Jonah learns a few things about God and when Jonah learns a few things about him. And see, folks, God is doing that with you and me, too. God wants us to know more about him and know more about us. Jonah needed to realize, man, I am, who am I to think that I can run from the almighty God? I am weak. I am nothing. You read that, you read that prayer and you realize that Jonah realizes, man, I was right there at the door of death. I was done. I couldn't do anything to save myself. But you, God, you took care of it. See, God will answer us as we learn more and more about him, more and more about us. Look at verse 9. Jonah says, I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. Now, <laughs> this is where it gets funny in my mind. Jonah's in his belly. He's not sitting at a table with a candle. He's laying in digestive juices and partially digested whatever that whale has eaten. It's stinky. It's tight. It's warm. He's reflecting on how amazing God is and what a worm he is. And he goes, God, I just want to praise you with a song right now, God. Oh, Lord, my God, when I'm in awesome wonder, consider all. Now, here's this fish trying to figure out what's that? Where's that noise coming from? Jonah's singing in the whale. This is what he's saying here. God, I can't offer an animal to you, God. I can't sacrifice an animal right now because there ain't nothing here but some fish tails. I don't know what this stuff is. But God, all I got, all I got is my voice and I'm in the middle of this fish. I don't even know where I'm at in the ocean. But God, you're a great God. How great thou art. How great thou art. He can't even lift his hands while he's singing. But he says, God, that's all I got. And then he says, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Would you put this down? God's answers sometimes come in stages. <laughs> I love this. Because we want an answer right now, but Jonah's answer came in stages. It says in verse 10, then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out on the beach. Jonah prays inside the fish, and I believe he started praying even before the fish, right? Because that's what this, this prayer is about. The prayer is, when you read it, you realize he's praying, saying, man, the waves are coming over me. I'm falling deeper and deeper. The seaweed's wrapped around my head. He goes through this whole thing. He is actually in the water. He starts praying when he hits the water, right? He's praying, God, I, he says in verse 6, I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth. Jonah's praying as he's fallen. He doesn't know how God's going to answer. It's not going to look the way he thinks it's going to look. But at the end of verse 6, it says, oh, Lord, you snatched me from the jaws of death. God snatches him from the jaws. He scoops him up with the jaws of the fish. That's stage one. He answers his prayer. He saves him. Well, he's, he's still not out of trouble. He's in the belly of a fish. He's alive. But he's inside the belly of this fish, and God has to teach him a few things in that belly. Look, if I'm God, I'm going, okay, I'm going to save this guy's butt. And I send the fish, swallow him up. I'm thinking four or five hours. Four or five hours sitting in that stank. He'll be good. And then I'll have him spit out, and everything will be good to go. Three days in that mess. Three days. Three days. 
God leaves him sitting in there for three. Stage one, God saves him. Stage two, Jonah, I think you're ready. Spits him out. God may answer your call in stages. He may save you to a point, and you look around, and you go, wow, this is good, God, but I was really kind of hoping that you would, like, pay the whole bill. And God's saying, not yet. You haven't learned enough yet. You need a few more days. My wife's a great cook, but every once in a while, she'll pull something out of the oven too early. And it's just not done. We'll cut it open and it'll, you know, depending on what it is, it'll ooze or it'll bleed or, you know. And we go, ah! And she'll go, ooh, I need to stick it back in for a little while longer. It's not quite done yet. God doesn't ever have that problem. God doesn't ever say, I'm going to answer your prayer, and then he answers our prayer, and then he goes, oh, I should have left them in that fish for a little while longer. They're not quite done yet. He knows exactly how long we need before he completely answers our prayer. And so sometimes he'll do it in stages until we're done to perfection. Because would you put this down? God knows the right time to completely answer your prayer. I want it now, God. You don't understand. It's going bad, and it's going bad, and bad, and bad. And it needs to happen right now. And God says, no, not yet. You're not quite done yet. You haven't quite learned what you need to learn about me and you in order for me to answer your prayer the way it needs to be answered. Now, Jonah was in a situation he had no choice but to wait. Sometimes God puts us in those situations. We don't have the answer. We don't have the means. And God says, just hold on. I'm going to answer you but it's when it's my timing and not your timing. See, there's so much we can learn from this prayer, you all, but if you get nothing else this morning, the greatest thing is this, that when you call to God, He'll answer you. He will answer you. That's a pretty amazing thing. There's one more picture that I want to point out as we close here, and that's this. This prayer in Jonah's situation is a perfect illustration of God's saving grace. If you look at the story, Jonah acknowledges, man, I was at death's door. I could do nothing to save myself. And God, you came. And you snatched me from the jaws of death. And listen to how he closes out his prayer. He says that it's God who saves alone. This is a beautiful picture of salvation. See, you can never come to God for salvation until you're willing to say, God, I can't do it. Jonah had to come to a point in his life where he understood, man, I'm as good as dead. God, without you, I'm as good as lost. I'm as good as dead. God, I believe that you came, sent Jesus to die for me, and if I place my faith in him, he'll snatch me from the jaws of eternal destruction because, God, salvation comes from you alone. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes?